Welcome to the Tied Together podcast, where we feature everyday people doing extraordinary things. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share so others can join in on the conversation too. Have you heard of the Clarks? Christopher and Candace are both huge beacons of light in the Jacksonville, Florida art world. Christopher has been in countless exhibitions, competitions, and opened his own art studio in 2018. Candace has been growing her jewelry line and curating Black Opal, the art experience that showcases artists of color. Though their work keeps them busy, their love for each other and their three small children are the glue that keeps it all together. Welcome the owner of Cooley Ross Art and the owner of Zen Slay Fu, Christopher and Candace Clark. Welcome. <laughs> Awesome, awesome to have you both. Candace, let me start with you. Tell me the meaning behind Zen Slay Fu and, and what's your motivation in, in creating this company? So the word uh, Zen Slay Fu itself is kind of like my art moniker, like my nickname, um, but it, it it's random, kind of like what, how I feel like art is. It's like random, it's colorful and things like that. And so, so is the name. A friend actually just made it up one day and I was like, hey, I'm rocking with it. So. Um, that's really where the name comes from, because a lot of people are like, well, why that name? And it's different, and art is different, so that's kind of like why I kept it. Um, but Zen Slay Fu in itself is uh, more about advocacy and exposure of artists of colors. And so uh, when I say that, um, I know some people don't technically like that term when speaking about Black artists, but when I use that term, I am actually encompassing all artists of color. And so uh, that's why I like to use that term uh, when it comes to Zen Slay Fu. Um, so that's what it really is about. It's about uh, helping new artists um, that are coming out and want to break into like, I guess, like the bigger part of Jacksonville's art world um, to get them out there because uh, we're kind of like on both sides. We've been on the side where it's uh, like Chris was the beginner or we were like new here. Uh, I'm from here, but I moved back after like seven years. So um, we've been on that side. And then like now we're like kind of on the other side where he's getting like the bigger shows and the bigger, uh, you know, events. And so uh, we kind of know like those connections and that was like a big part of Zen Slay Food, like bring the people out. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope. Um, when I was little, my mom used to take my sister and I to museums. I'm from New York. So we used to go to Brooklyn Museum a lot and um, a MoMA uh, Museum of Modern Art. And mm -hmm. there was a, a section, I think in Brooklyn that highlighted African art. But it was a, a small section and you just didn't see it a lot. You didn't see a lot of artists of color all over the place. Is that a reason behind you curating these shows like Black Opal? Definitely, because um, I mean, it's, it's common knowledge that probably previous to now that it's kind of like a, a white man ran type of business. Um, and so it, the narrative is switching, of course, now. Um, but that was kind of like, what I wanted to do was like make sure like this is about us, you know, um, because usually we like the tokens, you know, the tokens and uh, we shouldn't always be the token. Like there's so much like creativity, you know, in our communities. And so I just wanted to make sure that it was shared uh, with the bigger community. Right, right. Now, Christopher, so I am of Jamaican descent and in doing a little <laughs> research in you, I, I, it seems that you're not of Jamaican descent. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay, so <laughs> I'm familiar with Cooley. I'm familiar with Ross. And so Cooley is going to be your more Indian Jamaican, and then Ross is a Rastafarian. Um, I had no idea that there could be American Rastafarians. Is that somewhere your name stems from? Tell, tell me a little bit behind that. Yeah, so I actually um, grew up Rastafarian. Like my whole family, um, and we all had locks down almost to the floor when I cut mine. And... Um, I actually didn't know that Cooley meant an Indian Jamaican. I came up with the name Cooley. You know, Rasta is short for Rasta. Um, a lot of like elders in the Rasta community go by Rasta, like Ras, so and so, whatever the name is. But um, Cooley came from um, a DJ that I like, so actually a Chinese Jamaican DJ named Waggy T. And so um, I, I had this, I used to do music. And so um, I came up with a name called Swaggy, Swaggy Ross, um, like a play on the word swag. Well, I didn't really like the word swag that much. I thought it was going out of style. And like my whole life, um, everybody's always been saying how, how cool I was and laid back. So I was like, I like cool. So 
I changed it to Cooley instead of Swaggy, but I had no idea that Cooley was already like a term. So um, that that's where the name comes from, Cooley Ross. And also because my name is so common, like there's a popular artist out in California right now by the name of Christopher Clark. And I actually just um, learned of another artist who apparently looks like me, except <laughs> his hair is red. Uh, his name is also Christopher Clark. So that's why I go by, by Cooley Ross. That makes sense. That makes sense. It, it was shocking for me. And I'm not from Jamaica, but my family is. And so yeah. hearing that there could, there were American Rastas. And now that I, I've heard it about you, it's like, well, that makes sense. It's just like saying, how could there be a Christian in, I don't know, South America? Yeah. <laughs> of course, there are Rastas in the U.S., but that's pretty dope. So I see that you opened your own studio and you're inviting young people in to take a look at your work mm -hmm. and get involved in that. Uh, what's your motivation behind bringing the young people in? Um, just because when I was young, I didn't really, um, I, I don't know, I didn't really know of a lot of Black artists. And the few that I did know of, of uh, they were friends to the family and they took me under their wing too. So I wanted to be able to do the, the same for the next generation. Mm -hmm. I know how it meant to me and um, like how much it inspired me to keep going. So. Why do you think it's important to see people like you? And either one of you can answer this, but why do you think it's important to see people like you in the field that you're interested in? I think when you see people that look like you doing something you aspire to do, it, it lets you know that you can do it too. Um, when you don't see it, it's kind of like just a fantasy. But when you see somebody, it's like, oh, that's real. Like that's attainable. And I can have that one day because that person comes from um, similar circumstances and they're doing it so I can do it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to add to that and say, uh, especially like having children, um, I think that's changed my perspective. I mean, I've always wanted to make sure like there's people that look like me doing, you know, the things that I'm interested in. But having children has given me like another insight because they like kind of want to copy even the things that we do. So just imagine like uh, those kids that don't have like mentors or somebody to look up to, like if they don't have any imagery anywhere of anybody doing what they want to do is kind of like, well, how, how am I going to accomplish this? And so that's why it's really, really important. It's just like representation. There has to be something there, you know, because uh, everybody's going to want to go venture out into the world and become like the token. Like, like they want to know that they have like a support system that's already there in some way, shape or form. Yeah, absolutely. It can be difficult trying to navigate through life feeling like the only one, you know, the mm -hmm. only one that's trying to venture into something. Uh, what do your, your upbringings have to do with who you are today as far as who you are in the art world? Did you see this reflected? Um, how does that relate to now? Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately for me, I, I had a very um, diverse upbringing. Um, growing up Rasta and being around a lot of the uh, Caribbean community. Um, my, the middle school that I went to at the time, it was the only school that had the English as a second language program. So I had friends from all over the world. My best friend was was from India. And uh, I just grew up around a lot of uh, artists and musicians. My dad played in a reggae band. And so I would tour with them when they would tour around um, around the country. They would come to Georgia sometimes, go to Alabama, um, to the Black Heritage Music, Music Festival in Birmingham. And so I just got to see a lot and experience a lot of different um, cultures and, and things growing up. And I think that that contributed a lot to um, like to my creativity and just me knowing that, uh, that, I, that it was attainable for me. I saw a lot of people that looked like me doing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Before, I, before I let you answer, Candice, let me ask you this, Christopher. So when I was younger and my mom used to take me to these museums, I think it was the Brooklyn Museum that had whole rooms taken out of these historic houses and placed into the museum. And you could mm -hmm. kind of tour the house and see what it looked like. And I had this obsession with houses and real estate when I was a child. Um, and that was my favorite exist, uh, um, exhibition is when I used to go see that one. Um, so my mom would take us to go look at the African art and this and that, it, but I wanted to go there. I remember the feeling like, wow, I could own a place like this. I, I learned what an old Victorian house was by going and touring the, these um, pieces of, of houses, basically. Do you remember the feeling you had as a child when you would go to different places with your dad, Georgia, Alabama, or whatnot? 
Um, I don't know. I probably, you know, like when you're a kid, that kind of stuff sometimes doesn't, like it doesn't done on you, like the, the impact that it's having on you. And it's not until you get older and you look back like, man, that was a, a big experience. And um, a lot of things I probably, I don't want to say took for granted, but I was just a kid. So, and it was like normal for me. So I didn't think anything different, like, um, say a kid who's not used to that stuff, and they're like, wow, the museum, or I'm on stage with this band. Like, I remember I was a kid, and I was in the clubs with my dad and his band, like, seeing, like, uh, the Whalers band, or I, I remember meeting Layla Hathaway. So, like, that kind of stuff was, um, it was just normal for me. And so now when I look back on it, it's like, wow, like, that, that really had a great impact on me. I can see it now, like with the things that I'm doing and it's kind of crazy, but yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. How about you, Candace? How about your upbringing? How does that influence you to who you are today in the art world? Uh, so I've always been around art myself as well because I went to like art schools, although like my background is actually music as well. Uh, so um, I can't say that it helped me as far as like visual arts, but I was always around visual arts because you're at art school and there was like a lot of, I won't say interruptions, but we used to have like a lot of events during the day at school that just pertain to like the arts, whether it was dance or music or, you know, visual arts. And so um, I think that definitely has a part um, in my parents. They also make sure that we like went to like art museums. I always went to like art museums and uh, different places. And so I feel like that, you know, that, that, meant a lot in the long run um but I've always tried to kind of been like my own little creative black sheep type thing <laughs> so so um I think that's just like a part of me that it just comes natural like it's, it's just a part of me uh regardless to where I may have been raised or what I may have done I, I'm just different <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing how both of you had this um, upbringing in art and then would collide in a Circle K? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then somebody just brought it up, like Circle K, and then he's Chris with a C, I'm Candace with a K, and then all our kids got C and K names. And I was like, they was like, you can't escape the Circle K. I was like, oh, I didn't even think about it like that. <laughs> I hadn't either. That's pretty dope. So you all met in what, 08? Was it? Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. and, and, and Circle K, uh, Candice, you were already at work, and Chris was in the wrong place. <laughs> should not yeah. have... Should oh, not. gosh, you know the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the story, because he always tried to bring it up. I didn't laugh in his face because it was, well, it was funny, but it was funny because I did it too. So it was like, he was doing the same thing I had done, and I just thought it was like hilarious, and at the time, I didn't have like the type of uh i don't know how to say it restraint to where i would be like oh no i just like bust out laughing i probably wouldn't do it that way now but it worked <laughs> it's here 12 years later so <laughs> it worked it worked <laughs> i think that's awesome i think that's awesome um it just to me seems like fate or destiny or just meant to be you know the upbringings and then the how you both got together i think is amazing to speak a little bit more about your, your art experience, tell me about Black Opal, Candace, and how that even came about. Uh, so Black Opal um, was kind of like from being in the behind the scenes uh, at different events that he was at. I would like see what was kind of like going on uh, and, and like be like, I want to do something like this, but I want to do it in my own way. Um, and so for me, I feel like sometimes the wine and cheese scene for like art is not for everybody, you know. Um, it's not really for me. I can blend into it, but it's not really my thing. So I wanted like a marriage of like what our culture does with like this art culture all together. Um, and I just wanted to marry the two. And so, uh, and that kind of came kind of like at the same time that he was bridging more into, I guess, like the mainstream mm -hmm. art scene here in Jacksonville. And so it was like, we had a lot of connections. And I was like, well, I know if I do this show that those people will show up, you know, and, and they might find somebody that they didn't even know existed out here. And um, so that's like actually one of the, the biggest accomplishments to me is that a lot of artists tell me like, 
I didn't do X, Y, Z until I did Black Opal. Like, really put me in it. You know, they began doing, like, these projects with people they didn't know. And so, um, for me, that's really what it was about, was making sure, like, it's all these dope artists out here. Like, they, other people should know who you are. And um, I feel like a lot of times, uh, like, artists just don't need to get there. And so, sometimes it's not going to be just their research that gets them there. It's going to be somebody noticing them and being like, hey, you need to come out and do this. And so that's kind of like what it, uh, why it became what it was. And I wanted to showcase like different arts. So there was music, there's dance, there's poetry, there's uh, some of everything. And um, I, I love it because it's just like, I was shocked by, um, I've been shocked, I guess I should say, by <laughs> diversity in it all. Like, you know, usually when you hear like black events, you're saying only black people are going to be there or artists of color, only art. I mean, it was people, old, white, black, everything. Like, everybody was there. And I, we was wall to wall at the first one. And so it was just like, wow, like, people, you know, took uh, And I'm just happy that it, you know, it helped build some people's career up in some kind of way. Right, right. What was the prep like for that? Was it very difficult for the first one? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so for the first one, uh, Jacksonville isn't uh, very venue heavy. So uh, the first one, I'm like, well, how, how about doing this? Um, so it was like a whole lot of, you know, trying to find venues, looking everywhere. And um, I always tell people there's power in, in asking because uh, I found the venue for the first one by calling a place called the Five and Dime Theater. It's not even like a gallery, but I was just calling them like, hey, do you guys like, you know, rent out this space at all? And it happened that they were looking uh, for artists anyways to take up a space, um, like take up their gallery space. And so they were like, hey, if you can fill this space with art for a month, you can basically have a culminating event at the end. And um, that was like, I was like, if I never asked, it never would have happened. And so it like just came together so organically after that, that uh, I was just like, look, you gotta get out there and ask sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have a moment during the first Black Opal art experience to just look around and take it in while it was going on? Uh, yes, I did have a moment like that because the way it started, I was like, oh, I have messed up because <laughs> <laughs> we were there and it was like nobody else there at first. And I was like, what is well, going on? <laughs> it went from probably about 10 people to 10,000 people. Right? Oh, yeah, go to 10, yeah, it was a lot of people. It felt that way because the venue was small and we were wall to wall. Yeah, but we were, around. when we got there, it was I was like, oh man, like it's nobody here yet. <laughs> like I was like freaking out. Um, but it went from like that very odd space of like, oh my god, like what's happening to like people were flooding in, and I was like, where did these people come from? I knew that there was going to be um, at, at least a good showing based off of like ticket sales. Uh, before, uh, but it was uh, Jacksonville, they call us a walk-up city, so people don't, they don't come to an event, like you don't know if they're coming until the day of the event, because they want to walk up and buy a ticket, even if it costs more, <laughs> and it, the ticket did cost more, so it was surprising, but uh, I want to say, like, probably, like, midway when uh, people were performing, and uh, I was, like, in the theater room, and I just saw, like, all the seats filled, and like everybody being receptive to whoever was on the stage at that time, like that was like the moment of like, wow, like I really, I really did this. <laughs> like so, um, yeah, it it was definitely in the moment that I was like in the theater room, like looking at all the people, like sitting down, like sitting on top of each other, like just to see uh, what yeah. was going on the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's important to take those moments in. Um, I don't know if you all have seen some of the work that Tied Together has been doing, like as far as teaching the boys how to tie their ties and things like that. But the very first tie event that I had, I was frantic and nervous. You know, are enough men going to come? Are the boys going to care? Um, are they going to be bored? And um, I had a moment, much like yours, where I could stand back and I had to tell myself, chill out chill out and look around because I'm just trying to make sure get over here you get over there tie to tie so I told myself chill out and I like took a step back and I'm looking and the boys are smiling the volunteers are smiling the boys are learning and um it's it's not a feeling that you could recreate for yourself I couldn't just sit in this room and make that feeling it's the feeling that you get when you 
put so much work into something and you see it come to fruition. So I, I can definitely re relate with that. Um, Chris, oh, well, that's, uh, that's just, that's how it happens, I guess, because um, you definitely can't recreate it. Like, there's no way yeah. to recreate it. And uh, for people who aren't painters, you know, who don't paint, uh, that's kind of like your creation, uh, those moments with other people. So yeah. I definitely know why we have to sit back and like, look. <laughs> yes, yes. And live in the moment, L living right now, you know, and just, just look around and see what you've done. So I think that's yeah. dope. Um, Christopher, I saw that you sold your first, I don't know if it was painting, but piece of artwork in 2013 at the Jacksonville Art Walk. Is that right? Hey, you did a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't like the very first piece I sold, but it was probably the first piece I had sold um, after moving to Jacksonville. And um, that was like my, I think that was my second time going to the Jackson. I only went twice, but that was my second time um, vending at the Art Walk. And yeah, I had sold a piece. Um, it was a mid-sized piece and I, I had sold it for like 25 bucks. <laughs> I was so excited. Yes, I, got, I got one. <laughs> Did you know then at, at that moment, or when you decided to go to the art walk to sell your artwork, did you know then that that's what you wanted to do with your life? Or were you still just kind of getting into it? I knew what I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do in my life when I was like a little kid, like elementary school. So like my dream hasn't changed. Like anybody who's known me like from childhood to now will tell you that it's been the same thing, either art, I knew I was gonna do something in art, and something in music, or or both, and I, I had to put a, a pause on the music um, just to focus more on one thing, so I can get like actual things done. But I, I've always known it was going to be uh, either of the two. Mm -hmm. And now you're a full time artist, is that right? Yes. Tell me what it was like, the feeling, and I, I'd like to hear from the both of you to leave the security of a, a nine to five and go full time into yourself, basically? Um, my, my, I knew you could do it. <laughs> yeah, my, I guess I can say my nine to five life is pretty colorful. I, I don't know if that's the right word. Like I've, I've had a lot of nine to fives, <laughs> probably more than a lot of people. <laughs> Cause, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, like every, every job like somebody always is like like what are you doing here like, you could be working at disney or be making a cartoon or do even um at the last like real job i uh, was at Citibank. um i had a guy there he was trying to get me over into the marketing department he was like you shouldn't be like on this com computer talking to customers about their credit cards like you need to be utilizing your arts in some kind of way and um I don't know. I, I so many people had said it over the years, and, and I guess I didn't really truly believe that I could do it. And then uh, one day, I just I, I think I called Candace, and um, I had just pulled up to work, and I couldn't go into the building. And I called Candace, and I was like, I can't go into the building. Like I'm late. I'm supposed to be on the clock right now. I was like, I think I'm coming home. I don't know what to do. And she was like, well, you got to, like, do, like, what you feel. Like, you feel like you can do the art, then come home. And I'm, I'm just in the parking lot pacing. What, what, do then, you mean, um, what do you mean you couldn't go into the building? Like, there's a cutoff time, or you just didn't feel? He did, he did, he did. Yeah, I, I, like, physically, like, my body wouldn't walk through the door. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I was in, yeah, I was in the parking lot pacing, and then, um, I remember a bee landed on me, and I'm not really, like, into, like, symbolism that much, but something told me to look it up, so I just looked up, like, bee symbolism, and I can't remember the exact definition um, definition of it, but whatever it was, it, it made me decide, like, I'm not, I'm not going in, I'm, I'm coming home, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try the art, and um, I knew that, like, that I, I needed to be serious about it. And um, like that year, that was 2016. That I probably made more art in 2016 than any other year. So I, I was focused on it, like it was like a real 
like a real job, like a real career. And um, that was September when I left that job. And November, I had my, my first solo show. And um, the rest is history. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope. And I, I love, Candace that you said from the jump, like, I knew he could do it. I knew he could do it. Just get out there. I love that. He's really focused. He's, he's always been really focused. Um, I mean, uh, like, all the time. Like, he, his work ethic is, like, amazing. I wish I could have the same type of work ethic he has. And that's not just because he's my husband. It's just because, like, he really has, like, this work ethic of, of research and studying and uh and doing the work that's like one of his things that he says is do the work but like i don't think people realize how much research and studying this man does like it's a it's like a part-time job in itself it's him doing all this research and studying and it's not just studying art it's studying the artists it's studying the curators it's it's like he studies a lot and i'm not even gonna lie i don't have that work as it's like as much research that he does but i mean i knew he could do it because he i mean He's, I mean, he's focused. Even when he's like off track, he's probably still more focused than most, you know. So, um, I mean, I just knew he could do it. I mean, before the art, it was music, and I mean, I seen some crazy music days, <laughs> so I knew he could do it. Like, right. If he want to do it, he's gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. I think from from both both of you, it takes um, a certain level of bravery, courage, if that's the the right word, to bet on yourself. Um, Chris, for you to to leave your job and to go full time into art, Candace, for you to create the Black Opal experience, there are, um, and did I say that right? The Black Opal, Black Opal, the art experience. Yeah. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Um, because uh, there are a lot of people that would look at something like that as daunting and say, well, you know, if this doesn't go right, my name's attached to it. People are going to talk poorly about it. Um, for you, Chris, it's like you have a family. You had two children at the time. You have your wife. You have yourself. You have a household to maintain. And, you know, it's, if I lose, then I have so much to lose. But what does it take to say yes to yourself what does and i want both of you to to answer if you can yeah for me it's the um like the fear of i guess not knowing like i'd rather try and fail than not try at all because I, I think when you try that's not a failure at all because at least you try but you never try and you have this this life of regret like i wonder what would happen if i created that podcast uh, what if I would have pursued that art or what if I would have tried to become a teacher? So I'd rather try and know that I can do it or I can't do it than just like not try at all. So I tried and, and I'm doing it. Yes, you are. <laughs> For me, I, I, I guess I'm just not scared to bet on myself because I trust myself. So um, if, if I say I'm going to do something, I mean, because there's a lot of things I want to do. I feel like I'm kind of like a uh, a jack of all trades. Uh, but when once I verbalize, this is what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do it. So I, I just trust myself, at least with the things that I say I'm going to do. So it was easy to bet myself. Um, and then there's some things like uh, that I probably will end up pursuing because uh Although Chris is somebody outside of myself, he's somebody who like believes in me. So he'd be like, you need to be doing this because you can do it. And I'm like, nah, I don't really know about that. But it's like, it's like I got like this constant, like, like almost like second mind. It's like, you can do it, go do it. And so um, even though he's outside of myself, there's uh, certain things I feel like I would probably end up doing because there's like this encouragement on the other side. It's like, go do it. And so, um, I'm not. I'm not really scared to bet on myself. I don't. I don't want to be scared to bet on myself because I want my kids to go out there and to trust themselves and know that they can do do these things. Um, they. I don't think they quite understand what either one of us do so much. Because uh, yesterday I said he was painting, and it was like he painted again. <laughs> so like, yeah, that's Dad's job. She was like, that's a job. <laughs> I was like, I was like, yes, that's a job. So, um, but I just want them to like. Uh, see us doing things and know that it's not like you don't have to sit at you know a desk and you don't have to do xyz if you don't want to now if you want to that's totally different there's nothing wrong with that but I just want um from what I've seen they have creative sides and from what he's seen they have very creative sides and we want them to be able 
to pursue those things if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't, you know, we can't preach it if we ain't practicing. So, yeah, that's where yeah. it comes from. <laughs> I 100% agree with you. <clears throat> I say, I tell people this, and I'm, I'm not always met with agreement when I say this, but as a child, you're most children are told you can be whatever you want to be, right? Um, but then when you become an adult, you hear the story of, well, I don't do this because of my kids, or I sacrifice my dreams because of my kids. And, you know, growing up, I heard both sides and it sounded to me like you can be whatever you want to be until you have kids. And right. Um, it's not something I wanted to teach my son. Um, there have been things, my son's 16 now, and he gives me feedback and he is so level-headed, it makes no sense. I'm like, look, I didn't ask for you to be reasonable in this moment. I'm telling you, I'm jumping out on a whim and that's what I'm doing. But anyway, I want to show him that you can go pursue your dreams. Sometimes it doesn't look like it makes sense. But if you do the research, like you say, Chris does, you do research and it makes as much sense as you can make of it at the moment, go for it. Go for it. There are other jobs to be had. You know, if you quit that job and what you're trying to do does not work out, there are jobs to be had. Worry about that then, you know? But um, I think it's important to show your kids that your dreams can still be fulfilled even while having children. That's that's not a hindrance, you know, in my opinion. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I can't go. We go kind of um, like we're, we're known as the Clarks, which, we, which is like all of us. So, um yeah, they, they go where we go, so they, they experience it as well. But I definitely agree with you. Uh, I feel like my upbringing was like, you can be anything you can be as long as it fits in this box. Um, so I totally agree with that. And I know you was trying to say something. Yeah, I, I just, I hate, I hate when people say that. Like, um, like, I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to do this. And then I had kids. Like, I think if anything, um, kids should be the motivation to, I work even harder to um, achieve those goals, not to throw them away. Like I hate to see people like throw their dream away, and then when your kid uh, grows up and they have a dream, they kind of make their kid go into a direction like uh, like go be a pharmacist or go be a, a doctor just because they were afraid to um, pursue their dream, and now they don't want the child to pursue theirs because they feel like uh, like they were a failure, but I don't, I don't know. I, I just think that um, like the kids, they, they should motivate you to um, push harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my son was, def was and is my motivation to, to be anything, really. Um, yeah. As a child, I had grand dreams, and then somewhere in my teenage years, I, I just didn't have any dreams. I, I was chilling, <laughs> doing nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. And then when I, I became pregnant, um, he was definitely my push forward. Like, whoa, you can't chill for the rest of your life. You got a baby coming. Um, and even now, yeah. as I'm older and pursuing things, some things are scary. They're risky. Um, but I pursue them anyway to show him that you can. I don't want him to take my example of, of quitting on myself and use it for himself later down the line, you know? Yeah. And speaking of quitting moments, I know we all have moments where we're like, this is way too hard. Have either of you ever had a moment where you were just like, you know what? Maybe this is not for me. Um, and how did you make it through it? I'm going to let you answer that one because... Um, quit art, quit art <laughs> a lot of times. <laughs> I haven't quit. I just like I say that sometimes, but I, I don't mean it. That's but, what I mean. Quit. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think I've had a quitting moment like where I wanted to just stop, but like it does get um overwhelming sometimes. Like I, I'm, I'm like my mom, and I have a problem saying no. I just say yes to everything. <laughs> And so sometimes I tend to take on like a whole lot of projects. Like right now mm -hmm. I have about a thousand murals that I'm supposed to be working on right now, like all at the same time. So I, I should have probably said no to some of those, but so, so sometimes um, like I just overwhelm myself with, with work, but I, I don't think I would ever quit. I don't think I can quit. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's like breathing. So if I quit breathing, then, I'm, I'm not living so how do you make how do you get through the feeling of you know it being overwhelming um i think 
everybody probably has a, a feeling of being overwhelmed. The work's piled on, the kids, the house is dirty, the bills are due, blah, blah, blah. How do you, for me, I get into this like rut, like it's just too much and then I'm just not doing anything. I'm just thinking about all the things that need to be done and doing nothing at all. How do you get from the nothing phase to the doing phase? Um, yeah, I'm the same way. I, I get in that little rut and I kind of um, just want to be by myself and I go hide out in the garage or something <laughs> and uh, just stare at the canvas or something. But um, I don't know, like one of my daily affirmations is to just do the work. So like, every day I try to do the work, no matter how uh, big or small it is, I try to like make an effort to do something. Even if it's just like, uh, even if I'm not making art, I'm reading about art, or I'm uh, I'm on YouTube watching about art, <laughs> or I'm on Instagram looking at artists I like. Um, so I, I, everything is like focused on that. Like even when I'm in the rut, um, like it, it's always on my mind. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. try to just keep that uh, that mindset of uh, just do the work, like do something, like draw a line or scribble or something. <laughs> no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I like to write so I can um, compare it to writing. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to just write and I'm very picky, uh, a, a particular about my writing. I don't like to write garbage. You know, I don't want to write just for the sake of writing, but yeah. you have to, you know, you have to just keep writing in order to produce something that's worth reading, a story worth telling even when you don't feel like it. And, and I, I write in pencil. I don't, I don't type. Um, I don't use a pen. I like pencils. And then I have to put it on the computer. Yeah, it's annoying. Um, so then now I'm erasing and all this madness, but you just have to do it. Um, it might, and, and create it muscle be, memory. I say it might be a diamond hiding in that garbage. Yeah, there yeah. often is. <laughs> mm -hmm. you're absolutely right you're absolutely right so for the um the artist that is on his first jacksonville art walk um that's looking to sell his or her first 25 dollar piece and they see you and they see what you're doing and candace they see you putting on these these shows what would you tell them as far as you know how to get themselves going get their names out there and become bigger, like like I'm sure they dream to be. I I would say um, I I talk to a lot of artists um, that aren't like I guess like doing their art full time and things of that nature. Um, but I'm always like keep going, like because I've I've seen it, you know, I've seen it grow. I, I've seen it come from like the twenty five dollar piece to you don't sell anything that costs twenty five dollars, you know. Uh, so um, I'm always telling encouraging people to keep going because I've had a lot of friends come up to me and say they, they've been discouraged and I'm like but what <laughs> like you got to do the work because we all we all start somewhere um I actually was just talking to somebody yesterday and I just told him I said we all start somewhere oh mirrorless uh but yeah we we all start somewhere and maybe what you want to do may turn into something totally different Chris had no intentions of being a mirrorless uh and now um he has a lot of them um, already done and a, a lot of big projects that some people don't even know about that are on their way. And so I just say keep going and I feel like you'll find like where you belong in that art. Like um, like Chris is, I, I don't know, he's, he's made himself a muralist and he's made his work gallery worthy, you know. And so uh, you, will, you will find where you need to go, you know. So uh, I always just say keep going. Uh, do the work. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what he's gonna say. Do the work. <laughs> what was? <laughs> he said, "What was the question?" <laughs> I was saying, "Work in our walk, doing like trying well, to get that first us. piece, and like they see what you're doing. Like, how would you encourage them to get from the art walk to where Christopher Clark is today?" Hmm. I know that's like, how do you put that in just a couple sentences? You've done it for years. Yeah, I would just tell people, I I think what scares a lot of people, um, no matter like what field it is, like the first step is always the hardest. Like I think the first step is just like simply trying. Like a lot of people are afraid to try because they're worried about 
um, like what people are going to think of them or if people are going to like it or they're going to be successful, they're going to fail. Like you just got to like forget about all that stuff and just try. Mm-hmm. And uh, even if you do fail, I always tell people, like artists, um, I, I apply for a lot of art shows. And I see a lot of artists, they get down when they get that letter, they get that email to say that the art wasn't accepted. And I always tell them that, like, even if you weren't accepted, like, it's still a win um, because you at least, you applied for it. Like, now those people know your work and they know your name. Like, maybe you weren't right for that show, but you apply for the next show and they're like, oh, I remember that artist. And then you get in that show, but if you never tried at all, if you, you never applied, then, like, nobody knows you now. And so, mm-hmm. like, try and yeah. um, do the yeah it's funny that you say that um that you put your name out there and then they'll see you again my theory in asking people for any kind of exposure or anything and they reject me is that they'll forget um how they know me and eventually they'll see my name like oh i like that girl and they don't even know that they rejected me (laughs) (laughs) you know you just keep putting your name in their ear over and over and over again and they'll just remember you out of nowhere that's my theory i don't know (laughs) <laughs> but um, you were speaking about um, applying for art shows, and I know you applied for some art residencies, and I think that is mm-hmm. so dope. Have you gone to any yet? Nope. So my, the first one I applied for was, I think it's called the McCullum uh, Residency. It's in North Carolina. Um, I didn't get that one. The second one I applied for was Studio Museum in Harlem. I didn't get that one. And so I always like to share, like, my losses too, because I don't want people to think like from social media, people think that everything is great and they're like, oh, y'all are celebrities. Like people always tell us that y'all, y'all are famous and y'all, people, like, I don't, I think people think like we're rich or something. So we're, we're just regular people just, just grinding. But um, so I applied to, um, I, I kept trying, I kept doing the work. And so um, I ended up getting a residency in France and then I was contacted by some people. I had forgot that I even applied for this residency, but um, so other people contacted me. They was like, yeah, you, you got this residency in London. I was like, dang, I don't even remember applying for that one. But um, yeah, I haven't gone to those. They were actually supposed to be this summer, but because of COVID, they got um, pushed back to 2021. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to those. Um, Mm-hmm. It'll be my first time out of the country, and oh, wow. um, yeah, and it's it's just a that that's one of my art goals that I've had for a very long time, getting a, a residency, and so mm-hmm. now I can sit on it, I can <laughs> check it off the list and move on to the next one. Right, and just to clarify, so the art residency, um, you stay on a campus of sorts, and you just dive deep into art. Just explain it for people who don't know what that is yeah so um normally it's like a house uh, uh, the one that i'll be doing in france it's a uh, farm like a farmhouse with goats <laughs> like a really small village but um yeah you, it, it's basically like a retreat where you can get away from your the, the things in your everyday life like working or um just your everyday responsibilities at home now you go to this place and you can just just focus on on the art and they have a studio for you and you can just create and um it, it's a good thing when you do it um overseas or well, really anywhere that's that's not where you where you're from because you get to experience those people and, and different cultures and uh different surroundings and that may inspire you to create in a different way so yeah i'm gonna paint a goat <laughs> <laughs> Look, goat mural. (laughs) That's dope. That's dope. I love also that you share your losses because I think that it's very important for people to know that nobody's just out here just having win after win without any losses. Everybody's facing rejection. Everybody has losses. Everybody tries something and fails. Everybody. Um, It's my theory that your self-talk is super important, right? What you tell yourself Mm -hmm. about um, your victories. So I myself will tell myself, well, what if I lose? Or what if they laugh at me? Or what if they think that um, it's not good enough? And then at the end of all of that, when I'm done beating myself up, which could be 10 minutes or 10 days of beating myself up, I ask myself the question, but what if I win? 
and then I visualize what that looks like. And I go above and beyond of, of what that looks like. You know, uh, you know, I'm hanging out in the red carpet with Oprah or just take it just completely the other direction. And I think it's important to ask yourself real questions. Yeah, what if you lose? Okay, that's cool. But then what if you win? I think that's a valid question as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one thing that um, I'm bad at is when I win, I, I probably don't give myself the credit I deserve. Like, I don't want to seem like, like cocky or anything, but uh, I think that sometimes like you should like, like big yourself up, like like dang, I did, I I worked for it and I achieved it. So you should give yourself that that credit. I mean, other people do, but I, I tend to shy away from that myself. Like I, I always see the flaws and everything. Like dang, I could have did this better, or could have made that bigger, or I should have priced that higher. But like I I, I just got to start um, just congratulating my own self sometimes. Mm hmm. Yeah, we can, we're definitely our own worst critics, especially artists. Yeah. Artists are very hard on themselves. I don't like any of them. <laughs> you want it perfect, the way you envision. And the person you're, you're selling it to or giving it to is like, what are you talking about? This is amazing. <laughs> awesome. Well, you two are more than just your art. You are a couple. You are parents. Um, and I see that you're teaching your girls self-value, self-worth, um, and you've done that in the form, in many forms, but in the form of a book, Glonda's Hair. Can you tell people a little bit about that? You can tell the Glonda story. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, Glonda's Hair is a book uh, by Kristen and our do oldest daughter, Cadence, and uh, Glonda started because uh, Cadence uh, she was like three-ish and uh, she just came up to us and said her new name was Glonda and we was like what? She was like yeah my name is Glonda and it was so odd because I've never heard the name Glonda anywhere <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, she was really serious though like she was like call me Glonda I remember we went into a bank one time and the lady was like what's your name and she was like Glonda and I was like her name is Cadence and she was <laughs> Glonda, and she was like, I want to give you a uh, a sticker that starts with your name. She was like, it starts with a G. And so so <laughs> I'm like, I got to stop, you know, telling people like, no, my name is Cadence. They're going to think I kidnapped this child <laughs> because she said, that is not my name. Um, and so, I mean, she went for, for a while. It was it was months. Uh, and so Chris was like, he, he already wanted to create a book that, you know, in some way, spoke to like uh, her loving her hair and things of that nature. Kevin used to wear her really big hair out all the time. And um, she, when she said her name was Glonda, he was like, that's that's the book, it's, it's Glonda's hair. And um, it's just really funny because uh, she just, I, I've never heard the name, but it was funny, um, maybe like a year later, somebody with the name Glonda bought the book. Uh, uh, an older woman, she bought the book because she said, she had never seen anything with her name on it. So apparently it is a name. <laughs> I did see that. I did see that when he was selling the book, that Glonda was very excited about purchasing yeah. the book. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty dope. So tell me a little bit of um, how you all are able to maintain a 12-year marriage and be such good friends. You seem to really, really like each other, past loving <laughs> each other. That's, he's my best friend. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I um, think people try to make marriage seem like something different. Like, I don't I think um, <laughs> I'm trying to just figure the best way to say it. Like, I, I don't know. When people think of marriage, I think they um, people watch too much TV. <laughs> So people have all these ideas about like what it should be or how it should be. And if it doesn't go that way, they think that it's not working. But I think like one of the most um, important parts is to like be friends with a person first. Like if you can't be good friends, then you're not going to be good girlfriend and boyfriend and you're not going to be a good husband and wife. Um, I mean, there's, there's always, like, everybody has, like, flaws and stuff, so there's always going to be things that you may not like about a person, but just because you don't like things about 
your sister, you're not gonna say you're not my sister no more. <laughs> or, you're not my mom no more because I hate fussing me. But so like, I, I think people they want something that they think in their mind is supposed to be perfect, and um, is like nothing is perfect. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to um, I don't know. You just have to be friends and <laughs> and just uh, be willing to work through things and change some things about yourself and not everything, but, you know, change some things and, you I know, would, I wouldn't even say change some mold. things about yourself, change maybe some habits. Because yeah. I don't think you have to change yourself necessarily. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I can't speak, <laughs> I can't speak for like, everybody's relationship, but, like, we can like make jokes together. Like we, we never really had like a real like serious argument. And like the few times that we did, like it always ends in laughter. Mm -hmm. Somebody okay. saying something crazy or talking junk to the other one. So that's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I just think people gotta stop. I think another thing people do is they like when they get married. They're not trying to like please themselves. They're trying to please other people, like the friends and the family and the parents, and they're not really like doing it for them. And so once they do it, they realize, dang, I don't, I don't even really like this person. But all, <laughs> all stuff, you know, she looked good, or, but you know, my parents thought she was great because she's a doctor or something. But I don't really like her. I like this other girl who who's an artist or something. So <laughs> right. Right. You just gotta like stop worrying about what you think other people want to see or like what what you think society says is right and like just do what you feel is right. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, yeah, <laughs> <it'd> be, <laughs> <y 'all. laughs> yeah. That's actually like a really big thing. I would say like uh like the whole what he was saying like pleasing other people like even uh people like oh yeah I didn't have like a big wedding type deal but i mean that's really to please other people we was pleased with ourselves already right <laughs> like, <laughs> like i don't need to take you on a date to prove anything go sit down girl <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh yeah uh i don't know i always think i always say i think people think for some reason like a marriage is supposed to be way different from when you're a boyfriend and girlfriend or, or friends or, or whatever the case is like uh I mean, they always ask us, like, what, what changed when y'all got married? Like, my last name? That was, <laughs> that was like, the, the big thing that changed. And so, um, I don't know. I, I think we just keep being friends. Like, that's, like, that's the big part. We, we're friends first, I guess, kind of like we're friends first. We, like, and parents second. And, mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're <laughs> 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 Friends and parents is like what we are. <laughs> right. And I definitely see that. And you definitely joke on each other. And I think it's hilarious. The pictures that you take of him while he's sleeping and put your little taglines. Hilarious. But I can see that you two are friends and you enjoy each other, which is very important in any relationship. Um, I tell my son, you know, that I like him. Of course, I tell him all the time that I love him. But I explain to him the difference. Like, you, you can love somebody, but you don't have to like them. They could just right. you, you do not have to like them. <laughs> right. Right. And I, I, can, I love people right now that I don't necessarily like either, So <laughs> it's like that sometimes. It's like that sometimes. And um you both have explained to me, um, you know, a little bit prior to the interview that you haven't really had anything where you had to butt heads. And you explained it just now where you've butt heads with each other, but you've made it through some trying times together and still come out together. Um, can yeah. you explain for the people some of the trying times that you've had as a couple and how you were able to make it through together? So um, we have a, a quite the track record when it comes to like uh, losses. So I always tell people I've never really had like just a miscarriage. I've always uh, I've lost uh, actually four times uh, halfway through pregnancy. And so um, I, I, I know I wouldn't have been able to make it through if it wasn't for Chris, because I mean, I, I had, especially the first time, like, I basically like snapped, um, but um, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it, it's a lot to do with him, just like, 
mm-hmm. also being there to support and like give me the time to like to get through it like a, a lot of times he couldn't be there because he was like working or something like that and so I had I had moments where I had to sit with myself and like with these things that have happened um but I don't know I, it's, it's knowing that he was going to be there for me regardless to what happens um and it's also, uh, I think it's important because I feel like a lot of people blame themselves. I mean, I blame myself probably every single time. Um, but I think it's important to have somebody there to say, no, like, like why would you think think that? Um, so uh, it's, it's definitely, like, the support, like, just supporting each other. Like, I mean, obviously, he had to have that same support because he in the same situation with me. We're, like, we're, we're two, but we're one. And so... Uh, just supporting each other, that's like how we get through. Like we besides that, I guess it makes it easy. We haven't really had any other crazy like we don't have anything to pull from the back of our heads and be like, well, this happened, right. X, Y, Z, so blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think that makes it easy to get through really big things when you don't have all these other small things that uh I don't know, bothers or irritates one another in some kind of way. Right, right. So you all are not the only couple that that faces issues like that. And, you know, just to to uplift others that may have gone or are going through things like that, what advice would you give them for any, you know, down feelings they may be having at the moment? You know, I actually don't think there's like any words for it, to be honest. Yes, sir. Do the work. Oh. It applies to everything. Everything in life. Just do the work. <laughs> that would not be my advice. <laughs> yeah, like some people don't like even in even in a relationship, they go through one thing and oh, we're giving up. Or breaking up, cheating. But you just gotta um just do the work. Like Oh, I thought you were talking about to make a baby. Oh no, not to make it that. You do the work to make it easy too. You're, you're referring as to like how to maintain the relationship while going through a loss like that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because yeah. it does take work. Um, any kind of of course that's emotionally gonna take a lot out of you. And um how I received it, even though you explained you're talking about the relationship was um, to work on just work on your emotional well-being you know even though you're going through something you still have to do the work as far as making sure that you're okay at the end of the day and then of course doing the the work to make sure you're maintaining that relationship with each other so I think that's dope that's dope yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I feel in the end uh for women um like personally when they when they're going through that I know in those times there's not really there's not really words that can like really soothe you. I've heard them all, you know, um, I've heard a lot of stories. Um, so I think maybe that's like the one thing that comes out of a loss like that, like a devastating loss is that you know that you're not alone. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard, I don't know, maybe even hundreds of stories at this point uh, about people like, you know, with losses and, and things like that. And I, before it happened to me, I, I just thought it was like just me. Um, specifically, not losses, because I know a, a lot of women lose, uh, but like half halfway through losses is like a totally different thing. It's kind of like they tell you it's like one in, I don't know, a million or something for this to happen to you. Then, But then when it happens to you four times, you're like, yeah, I got to be alone. Like, it's, it's nobody else out there. Um, so I think uh, to a certain extent, hearing other people who have shared that same experience is sometimes soothing, but I don't feel like there's any words that like that can soothe you especially in those moments um because i i mean i've heard it all and i only i can reflect back on them but in the time it didn't didn't mean too much to me and not to say that people shouldn't try to soothe you it's just like like how do you soothe something like that like losing a party you know right so um, yeah i mean i think uh at least giving people the space to like share their stories with you can help you in the long run, even if it doesn't help you in that moment. 
I agree. I agree. And I think that kind of touches on what we opened the conversation with as far as representation. Seeing others that are like you helps you to feel like you can make it to or through something. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to, I want to say seek people out. Um, I've dealt with my own loss, but not in that manner where my son's father passed away when I was young and I didn't see anybody my age going through any anything like that. Um, and I didn't have the energy to be seeking somebody out that went through yeah. it. I was going through my own thing. But if you do find yourself with the energy to seek out somebody that's gone through what you've gone through, I, I think it would be beneficial. I wish I knew somebody at that time that had gone through the same thing so I could see them on the other side and say, oh, wow, you mean emotionally I'll be okay one day? Because yeah. it sure don't feel like it in the moment. Yeah. You know? And like what I meant is like, you just, if you just feel like nobody's out there going through the same thing, it's almost like it's a bottomless pit, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it, it didn't help me in those moments, but definitely after when I reflected, like, well, it's mm -hmm. not just me. It's mm -hmm. other people out here, you know, going through the same thing. Uh, but I guess to to Chris's word, to do the work thing uh, in the long run, I guess that is what it comes down to, because we still have three beautiful children that's the end. But uh, <laughs> we have three beautiful kids, and uh, uh, I don't know. They were every moment that we live in. Uh, there's one right there staring at me. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and you welcomed a new prince into the family. Is that right? Uh, yes. yes. He, he what is, is his amazing. name? <laughs> his name is Khalif. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. You. you got your little boy now, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Rap> over here. <laughs> People keep saying that he got his wife like, no, I got my boy, okay. <laughs> I know what but, you mean. Um, he is uh I don't know. I just I just, just look at him, I'm like, he's amazing and all my kids are amazing, but he went through a lot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just like crazy it's mind blowing that he's here, he's healthy, he's happy, uh with everything going on with COVID and he's sticky for months. And he's actually three months early. Like people don't realize like three whole months early. He was uh doing do June June twenty eighth and he actually wait, June twenty eighth? And he was born mm. April eighth. Mm. So um, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, I'm but, a mom. <laughs> oh yeah, you get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, he's uh he's been through a lot and uh even when he was in the NICU, we didn't we didn't talk much about what what he went through in the NICU. We didn't really share a lot about that. Um but that's why he's just so amazing because he really went through a whole lot. But he is he's home now, so and mm -hmm. being born coronavirus. Yeah, that's the craziest crazy. part. Were you able to be there with Candace? No, oh, he wow. was there. He was there when I was uh, like in labor, but I was actually in labor for like a whole week. Um, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, trust me, I didn't know you could sit at like nine, ten centimeters for days. Ooh. It happens. Uh, but it was, you know, part of them trying to keep him in, so he could, every day was like two days less than the NICU is kind of like how they explained it to me. And so um, he was allowed to be there, but he was not allowed to leave. Uh, the rules changed while while he was in the hospital. So uh, he brought me to the hospital. He was with me. He left one time. He came back. They let him know. He, they was like, if you leave again, you can't come back um, due to coronavirus. So for that whole week that I was in labor, Chris was there, not leaving the room. He was literally like in his room uh, by ourselves with the exception of the doctors and things uh, for an entire week. When I had Khalif, uh, Chris had to leave right after. So um, I went to like recovery Chris was there and then Chris went to go see Khalif and uh, that was it. Like he had to go home and so uh, and then I actually Chris saw Khalif before I did. So because um, uh, we saw him briefly for like seconds obviously when he came out but they have to take him right away. Uh, it was like seconds. I, like that's all I can remember and then uh, Chris went to see him while I was in recovery. And then that night, I thought I was going to see my baby and I had a fever. And they were treating me like I had coronavirus and I could not go see my own baby. Like, 
it was so crazy. Like, and then uh, after that, we we didn't see him together um, until he came home. So he spent two months in the hospital, and we saw him one at a time until he came home. So it was. This is definitely the craziest. Yeah. Experience. Um, with that, they had me in the overflow section with prisoners. I, I don't know. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's the, if this is any foreshadowing to who he's going to become, he's going to be a fighter and he's going to make it through whatever he's faced with. Has to. <laughs> mm-hmm. He fought his way in here. <laughs> he, right. He's he going to make sure. He will make sure that he succeeds. It's in him now. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So what do you two have up next? Parent-wise, art-wise, what's coming up next for the both of you? Uh, for me, <laughs> yeah, a, bunch of, a bunch of murals. Um, I have a few art shows coming up. I'm uh, having my first gallery solo exhibit coming up actually next month um i'll be putting out like more details about that on social media it'll be in uh, tulsa oklahoma at a gallery there and um yeah it's pretty much art mm-hmm. and uh but home <laughs> homeschooling <laughs> and we will be uh social distancing or what they call it? distance learning mm-hmm. yeah distance learning this year so um yeah just trying to get a I thought they were going back to school in Florida. Is that not right? Uh, if you want to. Some kids are going back. Our kids not. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, How about we'll you? Be, we'll be, um, yeah, we'll be venturing into homeschool uh, this year. Uh, still trying to figure it out for our, um, our youngest daughter because they don't really offer uh, homeschool programs for pre-K, so we kind of trying to figure that part out. Um, but for me, like the big project, it's already out, but it's uh, blackmuralmap.com. Uh, it's, dead, it's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, but that's like the big thing that I'm doing now. And so we're trying to get us some spaces to paint in. Uh, and I'm trying to make sure that I get every black mural in Jacksonville on the map. Then move on to the next city and uh, find me some collaborators and content makers in other cities uh, to, you know, expand because I want, you know, Kind of like the same premise with uh, Zen Slave Fool. I just wanted to make sure that you know that these artists, these artists are out here working. Like uh, I've seen a lot of mural maps, and a lot of times they, it's almost like they they're blinded to the fact that there's also black murals that represent black people in the city. And uh, so when they see a mural that's not necessarily a black person, and it's uh, like for instance, we have a mural here that's oranges. But it's by a black artist, and I want people to know, like, they're they're out here and they're working, and the goal is to make more murals. And so that's what we're working on now is obtaining buildings and things of that nature uh, to help put more artists to work and have more art exposure for them. So that's my big thing. Black Mirror Map. Yay. Um, Christopher, where can we find you on social media? Um, So you can find me everywhere on social media, Twitter. Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, all that. What's the uh, handle? Cooley Ross Art. Mm-hmm. And then do you have a website? Um, the website is CooleyRoss.com. Awesome. And then Candace, how can we find you? Uh, Zen Slay Fu. That's Zen, V-E-N, Slay, S-L-A-Y, and Fu, like Kung Fu. Uh, that's on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook as well, and then uh, the other page is uh, Black Mural Map. Uh, it's been about well, two weeks, and it's grown a lot, so Black Mural Map is the other way you can find me and find other art artists out here creating beautiful art. And Black Mural <laughs> Map is on social media? Oh, yeah. It's uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I think that's uh, the three, the big three is what it's on right now. Mm-hmm. But awesome. uh, the main thing is the Instagram. Awesome. And then Black.com. <laughs> and then how about Zen Slay Food? That has a website as well? It does have a uh, website. It's zenslayfood.com. Um, and there's been kind of like a little bit of a pause on it, but we're about to pick back up. There's a lot of artist interviews on there, so you're able to learn about the artists and learn about their art. Um, and then there's also some information about Black Opal on there. Awesome. Awesome. 
<laughs> Last question. Is there a quote that you all live by? That's what I was thinking. I was going to say something different. Um, oh, yeah, there is one. So th this quote, this particular quote, like everybody's heard it before, and it's, um, life is what you make it. But I was in the shower one day. Don't laugh. Uh, I was in the shower one day, and um, I was thinking about it. I had never really thought, like, we hit things all the time, like, like go through one ear and out the other. But when I actually thought about like what it means, life is what you make it, like I kind of focus on on the word you and then the words make it. And so if life is what you make it, then you should make the life that you want, make the life that you want to see. So we are all like with like you don't have to be an artist, like we're all creators and um in some sense. So you have to like the life you want is not gonna like fall out of a tree and, and land on you. So you have to like create it, like create, like, make the life that you want. So I like life is what you make it. So, so how about you, Candice? Because you said don't laugh. So I just, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, what was I don't um uh, I guess I just go back to what I just said a, a moment ago. But uh, trust yourself. Um. I mean, because if, if you don't believe it, you probably can't do it because <laughs> you already told yourself you can't do it. So so trust yourself. And I, I won't even lie. I've had moments where I, you know, that I've, I haven't, I guess, trusted myself in a way. And um, But in those moments when I do trust myself, I get it done. So uh, I would say definitely trust yourself is... Uh, that's what that's the that's the motto. <laughs> <laughs> dope, dope. Clarks, <laughs> I have yeah. truly enjoyed having you today. I can't wait to see what you continue to do. I can't wait to be able to come to Florida, but I ain't coming just yet. But I can't wait to come out there and, and go to Black Opal and come look at your murals and just see what you're doing live and in person. I think what you're doing is amazing. I love that you are influencing the community in such a positive way and bringing in some of the younger folks so they can experience experience you all and other artists and see that they can do it too so thank you for what you're doing in the community thank you thank you for having us <laughs> and our daughter who popped in occasionally <laughs> was that was that glonda oh no that was actually kalila that's how okay. I got <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome well again thank you so much and i can't wait to see what you do in the future thank you so thank much you. thanks When I speak to kids in high school, I always tell them that success isn't a destination, it's a journey. Right. And it's a culmination of choices that you make along that journey that will determine your level of success. Mm -hmm. It's not successful or unsuccessful because life isn't that black and white. Mm -hmm. it's not quantifiable like that. So a mistake may provide you a better lesson made you take two steps forward, but now you can skip 50 paces. Whereas if you get every small win, you're only taking a one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So for me, my purpose in life is to highlight specifically and, and destroy certain stereotypes and do collective healing from my ministry, and which is fatherhood and manhood. I believe I sincerely embody those. And it's not, I know self-praise is no real recommendation. However, based upon enough people pushing me to finally assume that leadership and public role, I reluctantly did it. But I did it coming with an artifact to show what uh, uh, concentration towards your priorities looks like. I don't want to ever be somebody that just watches everything happen. One of the best of bits of advice I ever got in my life was from, let's just say a nomad. He came in and out of my life in that day. He said, be a thermostat, not a thermometer. A thermometer could tell you the temperature of its environment. A thermostat controls it. 
And he told me that, and as that resonated with me throughout my life, I made sure I wanted to become an agent of change. So instead of just duplicating it and doing it, I could still duplicate it and lead by example. However, as an orator, you have to speak to the level of your audience. Right. So I have no problem. Like, I'm that liaison for everybody in the hood. Like I could talk to somebody in corporate America, a celebrity elsewhere, an athlete elsewhere, and then be on the block or working with dudes when they come home and in Baltimore to reduce the recidivism rate. Like I've put myself in enough scenarios in which my the, the hairs on my neck won't stand up. Mm -hmm. And when you say come home, you're referring to come home from jail or prison, correct? Yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. Just so people well, understand. We were, uh, we, were come, we were working with brothers and putting them in uh, positions in the community so that way they could start feeling some level of ownership in the community instead of just taking from it. Mm -hmm. It's very hard because you got to remember the circumstances a lot of these people come from, that community has done nothing but take from them. It mm -hmm. took lives, it took their innocence, it took their health, it took their freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a story behind how everybody gets to where they are. You know, I don't believe that anybody's born bad. You know, they have a, a, a slew of experiences that, that bring them to where they are. So you may hear that somebody's a felon or they did some kind of, of crime, but there's something that brought them there. And in order for them to now become a productive member of society and find their purpose, they need some level of grace from somebody. That's a, that's a beautiful word. Isn't it? Thing, and again, semantics matters. How do you define grace? Unearned um, kindness. Unearned care. Mm -hmm. You don't deserve it, but you get it. I, th I think you could receive grace and be deserving of it as well. Though. Of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah like, you can. I I'll be honest. Like Friday was like the best day I've had in a very long time. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it was just like good news after good news. And I was like, oh, this is dope. Like, this is what it feels like. I, I want to do this again. And then I realized, like, I feel undeserving of it. But I also look back and I'm like, I, I put in work. Mm -hmm. It's not by mistake. You know, mm -hmm. it's a reward also. I think grace could also be a reward. Yeah, that's or true. Or a job well done. 